and uh, welcome to this King's Digital event. Very exciting afternoon, I hope. I'm Michael Proctor, known to many of you, Provost of the College. Um, and we thank our audience for joining. Uh, we have nearly 300 people who've actually pressed the button, 400 registered uh, alumni, students and fellows. And we're very pleased that this includes alumni from Newnham College and a number of other colleges as well. So a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, we're gonna be hearing this afternoon about the amazingly exciting finds from the dig that took place on King's Croft Garden site on Barton Road last year, and what they can teach us about life and death in late Roman and early medieval Cambridge. It's great, it generated great media interest, in fact, including uh, a piece on the NBC in the United States. We're very happy about all this publicity, but this is really just the start. The story began uh, when existing buildings were demolished on the Barton Road site. It was known to be of architectural interest, but in fact, the demolition made possible archeological investigation of the area. The development at Croft Gardens is to build new graduate accommodation and is able, we're able to do this thanks to the marvelous philanthropic gift from an alumnus of King's to the campaign, the King's campaign. And that's also helping to drive many of the new student access and support initiatives that the college is implementing. The King's campaign is helping us to provide for generations of students now and in the future. And it's a wonderful bonus from the gift to have this opportunity with the dig to learn more about the past as well. As you would expect from King's, we're not stopping here. We want to look further into what can be learned from the excavation material. And we're appointing a new four year research fellow starting this autumn to do this. There's a phenomenal opportunity to throw more light on this period. And I'm delighted now to introduce you to the two distinguished experts who will tell us much more. The Dr. Caroline Goodson is a university senior lecturer in early medieval history, and she's a fellow of King's. And Dr. Sam Lucy is an archeologist of Roman and Anglo-Saxon Britain and director of admissions, both for Newnham College and in fact, for the Cambridge Colleges as a whole. Very warm welcome to them and thank you for coming to talk to us. And I'll now hand over to Caroline to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Provost. Um, I'm going to start today with a, a really brief presentation of the findings from the site uh, and then we're going to talk through uh, Sam and I about about what this means for our wider knowledge of, of Cambridge of uh, of a period of enormous transformation in Britain from the, the late Roman into the early medieval period. Now, uh, as as pro, as the provost just mentioned, we, um, we we come to know about this site. Uh, in this in this case, through uh, a building project from the college, and um, I'll just show you here if I can share screen. I'll show you a map of what we're talking about. Right, so there we go. So here's um, a Google Earth view, um, and you can see here's the chapel. So here's Kings, and the site that we're talking about is is here on the Barton Road. And those three green roofs are the roofs of the buildings that were um, that were uh, replaced or in the process of being replaced. And it, it's probably worth explaining that that there's a legal framework for the preservation of archaeological uh, remains and heritage sites in England. So any um, planning permission requires the assessment of whether or not there's a likelihood of encountering uh, heritage assets. And the college was, I think, very, this is before my time when we started this project, but the, uh, the college, I think, was very well aware um, that there was a very high likelihood of encountering archaeological remains on this site. And it's worth thinking a little bit about how we know about that. Um, when those three buildings with the green roofs went in on the Barton Road down here in about 1910, um, some, uh, um, some cremation urns from the early medieval period and some inhumations, that is burials from the early medieval period were recovered. And even before that, in the 1880s and the 1890s, there's, there's um, evidence that came up. Um, Baron Anatole von Hugel, who's a fascinating, curious character, he was the, the first curator at the Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology here in Cambridge. He was an anthropologist of Fiji and of, of the Pacific, but when he was in Cambridge, he also liked to poke about and he lived at Croft Cottage. 
And so he uncovered um, metalwork that came from inhumations along the site at Barton Road. And he donated his collection of stuff that he found in Cambridge, as well as stuff that he found in the South Pacific to the, the, the museum collection. So if I go forward a little bit, um, here is a page from Cyril Fox's fantastic book about the archaeology of the Cambridge region, which was published in 1923. He knew about inhumations here at Croft Lodge, things that went to, that were recovered in, um, in 1910, and also uh, pottery that went to the British Museum that was labeled uh, as coming from the Barton Road. And here is some other material that was added to the Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology. This was bought in 1936 from someone who remembered it coming up uh, from the site at Barton Road when the flats with the bright green roofs went in. And the kind of things that you're seeing uh, in this picture are the kind of things that come that are that are typical of early Anglo-Saxon burials. We'll, we'll look at a few more examples of them. Um, I'm going to now uh, show you a little bit about what we uh, have found. And it's worth just mentioning um, that while I'm going to be showing you some images of human remains, so there's going to be some, some early medieval skeletons coming up. Uh, if, if that's alarming to you, please avert your eyes. Um, the, the, the building work was carried out by Albion Archaeology, and we really want to thank Albion and the team that did such an excellent job of excavating these remains. Here they are uh, at work. And here is uh, uh, some image, uh, some images of what they found. So here's a drone picture of the site. You can see we're looking north here towards towards Newnham, um, and and this is the Barton Road right here. And what you'll see here, and here's a slightly better view. Um, you can see there's very large ditches, which I'll talk about in just a second. Some Victorian drains from the um, from the 19th century buildings in the area, and quite a few graves located here. And here is a, a phased plan that, that helps us to understand that we're looking at material and, and, um, and archaeology that comes from, uh, from the Iron Age uh, all the way through the Roman period and then into, uh, into the modern period. And one of the things that's very interesting about this site is that we've got what look to be Roman graves as well as later Anglo-Saxon period graves. Now, what does that look like? Well, here is something that is pretty, um, that, that looks like it might be Roman. I put Roman question mark because we need to have some carbon 14 dating to, to understand a little bit more about the chronology of this, but there are um, a handful of these graves, of these inhumations that have stones lining the edges and that are unfurnished. That is to say that the individuals who are buried here don't tend to have um, jewelry or objects buried with them. And that would be in keeping with what would we what we would expect for Roman graves of the of the late Roman period of the third or the fourth century. And here is an, uh, an early medieval burial. Um, so we shouldn't make too much of the position. It's true that this inhumation has a slightly different position than the other one, but that's, that's not particularly indicative of the chronology. What is indicative of the chronology is the materials that, were, that this person was buried with. So you can see here um, some, some beads, I hope, um, that went around this person's neck. And there's a couple of brooches here. So, the people who went into these graves, uh, as would have been typical for sixth century burials in, in Britain, uh, were buried wearing clothes. And so they were buried with the, the, the clasps and the brooches that held together their clothes, as well as some of their, um, their objects of personal adornment. Sometimes they're also buried with weapons and with tools. Sometimes they're buried with pieces of pottery or pieces of glass. And I'll show you an example of that in a moment. But we've got um, a sort of very typical early medieval British burials in that they've got stuff with them. And, and that stuff I think is quite exciting. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, very quickly. Now we've got about 60 um, individuals buried here. Not all of the graves had intact skeletons in them because of later interventions, the Victorian drains sort of cutting right through them, or later burials that might have mixed them up. And sometimes the soil conditions affect the degree of preservation. So actually on this person you can see, we've got these long bones, but we don't have a lot of ribs. And that's because the long bones are, are more robust, they're denser bones, um, and, and ribs are, are much thinner and more friable. So those have decomposed, whereas the, the long bones haven't. Um, 
This is a plan of the area um, showing some of the some of the graves and the position of the burials here and these ditches. Everybody here is on the river side of these great ditches. Here is the ditches as they were being excavated. And you can see that they're, they're, they, they may have been dug originally in the Iron Age and continued in the Roman period. And they were recut several times to allow for whatever, whatever they were doing to, to continue into the early medieval period. And these serve as a sort of boundary for the cluster of graves that we're talking about here. Some of them clearly went um, underneath the Barton Road, um, and certainly on the opposite side of the road, there have been some uh, there have been skeletons excavated, and some uh, Anglo-Saxon early and uh, early medieval material culture comes from across the road as well. So we don't have the whole cemetery here, but we've got a really good chunk of it. Now. This cemetery relates um, to other activity that's going on in this part of Cambridge in the fifth and the sixth centuries. Um, the, the objects that we have speak to, a, a, they speak very neatly to later fifth and sixth century burials. Um, the, there's a very, very good chronology of these kinds of objects, of these, of these brooches and things like we've been talking about. So let me show you an example here. Um, this is one from one of, the, um, one of the graves before it was conservation. And here it is, we x-rayed it in order to get a better sense of, of the degree of preservation of the object. Um, and here is a drawing from Sam's book that, that shows that it reconstructs uh, the way women dressed. Uh, not all of these objects, not all of these kinds of objects of personal adornment went on women, but a lot of this jewelry did. And we've got, as I said, this very, very good uh, chronology of how this kind of jewelry changed in Britain over the period of the fifth and the sixth centuries. And those changes have to do with migration of people moving from the continent to the island of Britain, islands of Britain, to, uh, to people moving within Britain. And they also have to do with um, the movement of objects. So sometimes, sometimes objects move independently from people. They're bought on the market in there and they're exchanged. And they also have to do with changing tastes and regional preferences. Um, so so there, there's all kinds of really interesting information that we can tell about people and their cultural connectivities when we study um, in detail the objects that these women wore and were, and were buried with. Now, I am not an expert in this. I, I tend to work on the Mediterranean. I really don't work very much on, on Britain. Um, and there are experts who are doing that kind of fine detailed work examining and exploring these objects. Um, I, I'm gonna guess that with this person, we're, with this, with this uh, grave and with this object, we're looking at something that we, is, falls into the category of Martin type three or type, uh, type four, which has a dating um, that goes from about 475 to about 550. And, uh, and again, we'll be able to verify that with other forms, but that gives us, I think, a pretty good sense of, of the chronology of the, of the burials that we're looking at, at least those that have these kinds of, of objects in them. And it's this, this is a sort of um, a map, a heat map showing the location of this um, phase C kind of cruciform brooches. This person uh, who wore that brooch, here's the field drawing of, of the grave, um, also had a, a, a string of beads, of amber beads. Um, there are dozens of amber beads that come along with it. Um, and a couple of other wrist clasps and other objects of jewelry. And there's a very interesting, I think, story that we might want to think about with this person. So the person that was wearing that cruciform brooch, um, Corinna Duhigg, who's doing the, the, the preliminary skeletal analysis for Albion archeology, span um, gave me her sort of quick notes about this person. Um, that this is a very young adult um, female, most likely, uh, probably around 18 years of age. Um, and she was buried initially, and then into the same grave, the, the ground was opened up, and into the same grave, after the, the ligaments that had held the bones together had decomposed, another person went in 
And the next person who went in was uh, very probably male um, and also a young adult, about 18 to 25. And you can see here the way that the long bone, that some of the bones of the first burial were, were sort of displaced, a little bit moved to the side for the burial of this next person, who is also um, wearing a, belk, a, a buckle around his waist and has a couple of other objects associated with him. So were they related? Were they married? What's, what is the relationship between these individuals? We don't know yet. And we, we might have means to start to ask those kinds of questions. Um, we, could use, we could do DNA on the individuals. We could look at, um, at signs of, 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 of genetic similarities or differences. Um, but it's these kinds of stories that emerge from cemeteries of the Anglo-Saxon period and that are emerging from the work that we've been doing at Croft Gardens. I'll just give you one um, other really quick example here. This is a person um, uh, uh, um, most, most likely male, um, about one meter, eight, 80 centimeters tall. Um, he was about uh, 30 when he died. Um, he had, um, he's got markers on his bones where the, um, where the deltoids inserted to the, to, the, to the upper arm bones, which suggests that he, had, that he used his upper arms extensively. And again, I want to thank Corinna for her, um, for her uh, notes on this or her, and her uh, interpretations of these remains. He's buried with a shield. Um, he, there's a, you can still see the boss of the shield here. And he's buried also with a really extraordinary glass vessel. You can see it here with the trowel uh, in the ground. And then there's also a spear tip here. And here's the glass as it's uh, uh, under conservation now. And I think if I click that, you'll be able to see it spinning around. So you get a really good sense of, of just how, um, uh, how, how well preserved this is and what a beautiful, beautiful object it is. Now, this is not totally rare, but this is hardly common. So this is a, a really special grave of a man who's got this glass, uh, his glass vessel with it. Again, we need to start thinking about what, what kind of questions we can ask of that individual grave. It, it was he, uh, what, what was his status vis-a-vis -vis the other people he's buried with at the same time period? Why is he buried with weapons? Why is he buried with these particular objects? Why is he buried with a, with a really smashing glass vessel? Um, and I don't have great answers for this yet, but these are the kinds of things that we and the, the JRF that we will be appointing who will take on the study of this site will be able to, to tell us about. Now, Croft Gardens comes in a wider landscape of, of burials, and, and that's something that Sam Lucy has done really quite a lot of work on, thinking about how this western side of the River Cam has a, um, a, a landscape of burial that goes from Girton down through St. John's playing fields to Croft Gardens and to the area at, at, in Newnham, and then down, down further in, into Trumpington. There's a, a considerable number of graves that have been identified of the Anglo-Saxon period uh, up and down this, this side of the river. This is not the only place, place that people were buried in post-Roman Cambridge. Um, some, some very recent commercial work around the site of the Cambridge airport in, Cher in Cherry Hinton is revealing another very extensive cemetery with about 120 people from the early Anglo-Saxon period. And there's quite a lot of antiquarian work that happened in the 19th and the early 20th century where people were able to identify that there were Anglo-Saxon graves, but they weren't necessarily uh, excavated scientifically or with attention to maintaining all of the bones and all of the objects together with an individual uh, in order to kind of ask the questions that we're interested in asking now. So what we've got here is a population of very normal people for the most part. Yes, this person with this really extraordinary glass beaker may have been higher status than some of the other people, um, but we don't have any objects that have a lot of gold on them. We don't have any of those, um, those really stunning uh, garnet and gold jewels that, that we might find elsewhere. And that if you've seen the dig, you will know are part of the, the burials at Sutton Hoo. Uh, or if you've been to the British Museum, for instance, uh, uh, for that matter, where, where you can see those objects. So we're dealing with, I think, a, 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 very, um, a very typical population 
the majority of people living in Britain in the fifth, sixth and early seventh centuries were more like these people than they were like the very high status burials uh, down in Trumpington or, uh, or out at Sutton Hoo. And so we've got the opportunity to think about everyday life um, every, and, and everyday death uh, in, in this part of Britain in a period where we've got enormous migration and movement of people and very, very large scale economic and social changes at play. So I want to now um, uh, stop sharing this screen if I can. We, I've got some other pictures that we can come back to if it's at all useful. And I want to, to start talking to Sam and, and asking, I'm gonna ask the questions, everything I wanted to know about an Anglo-Saxon cemetery and Sam, who is absolutely um, the expert in this material um, is going to be able to tell us. Sam is just by way of introduction, the person who wrote um, The Anglo-Saxon Way of Death. This is an absolutely stellar book. If you're curious about these issues, it's a really, um, it's a, it's a really useful and as well as informative book. Um, so I, I, endorse, uh, I endorse it uh, wholeheartedly. So Sam, what, how, can we, how can we start? Um, can you tell us what Anglo-Saxon cemeteries tell us about Anglo-Saxon life? Uh, yes, that's a very, very big question. Um, yes. So I think it's probably best to think about the different sorts of information we can get out of these cemeteries. And it probably falls into a number of different areas, um, partly about um, the, the ways in which people were living, what they had right and wrong with them, the different sorts of social makeups, you know, in terms of age distributions and that sort of thing, but also partly about chronology. And, you know, as you said, a lot of these burials are furnished burials, which means that people were being put into the grave fully dressed. Um, and that includes people who were being cremated actually. So when we do excavate cremation cemeteries, there are still you know, burnt dress fittings, um, some elements of things that were clearly holding costumes together. So we can start to get a sense of um, what people were buried wearing, and there are lots and lots of different bits of information that we can draw out of that, but actually the study of the material culture itself um, can give us chronological insight. So what was happening at different periods within this broad kind of 5th, 6th and then possibly into the 7th century period. Um, and it's something where people in Britain have sort of returned to in recent years. There was quite a long period of time where chronology essentially fell out of fashion. And, um, you know, when I was um, sort of starting to write about these things 25 years ago, you just had a sense that sort of between about 450 and 550, 580, there wasn't actually that much resolution. You know, we still talk about fifth and sixth century cemeteries, um, but actually there's been some really, really um, good projects done over the last 10, 15 years that mean we now have a much better handle on chronology through this period. So part of what we can do is to start to work out who's buried all more precisely in what period and are things changing throughout the course of this, um, this time uh, and to see you know, if representations of gender are changing, which they clearly do. Um, we now know, for example, that um, almost nobody is furnished between about 580 and 620, apart from some very, very high status burials. Um, and that's obviously the, the sort of period in which the Sutton Hoo burials are, are taking place. So, um, you know, for some reason, after about um, 580, furnished burial is less important, particularly for women. And then it picks up again in the middle of the seventh century. So we're starting to get a much better handle on what's happening at what point. And with that better handle, you've then got a much, much closer social resolution. So you can start to ask much more detailed questions about how are children being treated in burial? How are women and men being treated in burial? And then start to work out from those patterns what the social structures might, might have been looking at. Um, so, I mean, that's just a, a sort of a, a very brief kind of snapshot. We can do much, much more with kind of health data and, um, you know, age at death data, correlations between um, all the different variables that you that you get during this period. Right. So you're, you're identifying a change in, in what historians and archaeologists are asking and, and a return to understanding chronology. 
Um, that's presumably happening despite the fact that there's a problem with radiocarbon dates. Yeah, um, yes, so the, the, the main um, chronology project actually focused on the later 6th and 7th century. And the reason you say there is a, a problem with radiocarbon dates, it's all to do with the calibration curves in this period. And unfortunately for um, the second half of the 5th century and the first half of the 6th century, the radio calibration curve is essentially flat. So um, even when you have a radiocarbon date, it gives you a range of different possibilities for when that date could be. Um, the early fifth century is better. That's a steeper um, section of the calibration curve and the seventh century is pretty good. So the main um, radiocarbon dating project was done as, as I say on seventh century material. So that's how we now have this much clearer sense of Sutton who happens and then we get our nice golden garnet cross burial type uh, bed burial um, sort of phase associated with female graves in the middle of the seventh century. Um, so yeah a lot of the work that's done on the later fifth and sixth century work is still based on the material itself rather than um, necessarily the radiocarbon dating because you can't get quite the right degree of precision during that period still. Um, but you can use lots of other methods. Uh, as you could see in the cemetery plan, we've got some graves there that intercut. So you know that this grave was put into the ground at some point after the grave beneath it. And so you can start to piece together those kinds of information as well to start to build up a sequence of what happens through time. And so that greater understanding of chronology is, is really important because of the kind of wider picture of what's going on in Britain at this moment, isn't it? Really important, yes. And um, uh, one of the things that we are starting to get better appreciation of is that um, things are happening at some slightly unexpected periods during the fifth century. So um, we have had for a long time chronologies for material culture items that start in AD 450, because that's when the historical sources talk about migration and, and everything is kind of resting on the shoulders of that. Whereas actually we've now got a much better sense that certainly cremation burial is happening before that point. Um, Catherine Hills and I um, did a project looking at the, the chronology of the big, um, the still the biggest cremation cemetery, which is at Spong Hill in Norfolk. And that's very clearly in very active use in the first half of the fifth century. So before historical records, and obviously they're much later historical records, but before they suggest that there should have been any of that activity. So um, there's a lot of really interesting work going on in the fifth century now, and also in the later fourth century, um, because it's clear that in certainly around the Cambridgeshire region, when you look at late Roman rural cemeteries, they are being buried with some grave goods. So, you know, you saw the burial with the claw beaker and there was also a pottery vessel by the head. We've got lots of late Roman cemeteries out in the Fens where people are quite systematically buried with pots by their heads. So you've got some continuities of inhumation practice that we're seeing through the sort of late fourth and into the fifth century. And we're seeing some interesting um, elements of con some continuity of the, the sorts of material culture that's being used as well. So, you know, provision of bracelets and finger rings with some burials is a practice that seems to run through that period. So there's actually quite a lot of work we can do looking at the fifth century now. There is quite a lot of potential for radiocarbon dating, particularly for the first half of the fifth century because of the curve. Um, and so I think that's that's a really interesting potential. So that's one of the things I find most intriguing about this site, you know, is those stone lined graves on a slightly different alignment and then some overlying clearly fifth, sixth century graves. So what, what is the relationship between those people? I think there's some really interesting potential for you know, seeing if that's part of the same population who are just then being buried in different ways, or if you've got any evidence of people having moved from somewhere else that we can look at from the isotopic results. So lots and lots of potential for, for starting to address some of those really important questions. Right, so, so, so are we talking about a, um, a post-Roman British population or are we talking about uh, a migrant 
Anglo-Saxon population. That's th there's there's quite a lot of movement going on here, and um, you know it, your 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 comments are, are are certainly true that we we used to think about this period in in terms of dating and in terms of of the broad picture of what was happening basically because we had Bede, right? Basically working off of what Bede told us had happened, which was this great migration of Anglo-Saxons and Jutes. And they, they went to different parts of, of what's now England. Mm -hmm. um, if we threw Bede away entirely, mm -hmm. would we be better off? Possibly, yeah. So, I mean, Bede is obviously an eight, an eight <laughs> <laughs> but for, for this particular aspect. Um, so Bede's an eighth century source. So it's somebody writing in the eighth century talking about things that happened 300 years beforehand. So of course, it's not going to be an accurate depiction. Um, and we all know that Bede was written for certain political purposes anyway. Um, so I think there are now some potential tools that we can use. And I think we also have a much more sophisticated concept of what an ethnic identity is and the ways in which we might be able to interpret it. So I think we do have some fairly simplistic models that underpin quite a lot of thinking. And we do need to, th to think about things in a more nuanced way. As you said, Caroline, you know, these are rural communities. They are people who are um, sort of farming, creating their own food, making their own textiles. They probably didn't have some overarching sense of, you know, belonging to a, a, a bigger population group. So I think there's there's lots and lots of interesting questions that we have about ethnic identities and social change during this period. Um, and we do have to be quite alert to the fact that some of those ideas about ethnicity are actually underpinned by some fairly flawed assumptions. So I think if you had stopped one of these people in the street and said, who are you? they would have told you quite firmly that there's somebody who lives next to this particular river and they might not not have had some kind of overarching sense of belonging to any any bigger group than that um so you know this is a period without print media or um you know any kind of system in which you in, in which you kind of get the sense that you belong to that bigger group um so yeah some some interesting things i mean we can use for example um isotopic analysis and that can sometimes tell us when somebody spent their childhood in a different location from where they were buried. So you can get um, some idea of people who have moved during their lifetime. Um, and that gives you some insight into the extent of population movement. Actually, when we've done isotopic studies on other cemeteries of this period, um, the answer is that most people seem to have grown up in that broad locality. A few exceptions, but, but generally the, the pattern is that. And where you do have evidence that people have grown up somewhere else, often they're not buried in the way that you would have interpreted from the material. So when we analysed one of the sites in Yorkshire, for example, the people who were clearly migrants happened to be the four women who were buried in slightly odd positions without any grave goods. So it's not the ones buried with the beads and the brooches that classical archaeology would have told you were coming from somewhere else. So actually, it's a much more nuanced and um, complex picture than, than you would assume from just reading bead. Right. So, yes, um, the, the question of ethnicity, this is something that people working in the Mediterranean are working on as well. Sort of thinking of the way the, the, the ways in which ethnicity was on the one hand biological and recognizable by things like DNA and on the other hand constructed situational and, and a social product. So a barbarian and a Roman might dress exactly the same but have quite different biologies or, or vice versa. And so, so the same kind of insight and shifting of the way in which we ask the question is happening uh, here in terms of early medieval Britain, isn't it? Yeah. And, and the other thing that's emerging from work that people are doing in terms of isotopes and in terms of, of, um, of, of looking at DNA and genetic material is, is the understanding that people are moving around quite a lot within Britain. Am I right? 
Yeah, that's right. Um, so surprising amounts of movement. I mean, to be fair, we do have we do have to recognise that we are still developing isotopic analysis and its interpretation. So, um, you know, for, for a certain amount of time, um, it wasn't recognised, for example, that the way that you um, treat your food and your drink can have an impact on your oxygen isotopes in particular. So there is a now quite a widely recognised brewing and stewing effect. If, if you eat lots of um, stews and uh, beer, for example, um, you will look as if you come from a warmer place than you really do. Um, so there was, you know, a very nice um, study of a site down in Kent, where it looked like the whole population came from southern Europe. Um, and of course, that's not realistic because it includes tiny children. So, you know, it's we are still kind of refining those techniques. And that is quite important to recognize, I think. Um, but, but certainly when you get a wide spectrum of oxygen isotopes from a single population, then yes, you can start to think about, you know, this probably isn't just a dietary effect. It probably is reflecting that some people are coming from further afield and some people have been born locally. And what does that tell us about the population that we're looking at here and their kind of interrelationships with other communities? And, you know, is it your women who are coming from somewhere else or is it your men? You know, those kinds of questions you can start to interrogate in a bit more detail. Mm. Yes, gender seems to be a really big question for the early medieval period in Britain, um, partially because these women are wearing these huge sort of pieces of jewellery, um, or if they're or maybe not wearing them, maybe they're only buried with them. But but some of them, certainly, they seem to be wearing quite a lot. Um, why do you think there was so much investment in, um, in, in the way women were dressed? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And um, to a certain extent, it's not a huge investment of resources you know the big big brooches that you see are copper alloy brooches so they're reliant on you know somebody knowing how to make these things but inherently the material itself isn't that valuable the beads will generally be kind of glass and amber beads um, so it's not until you get into the seventh century that you start to see very high value artifacts you know the gold and the garnet that you were talking about those really are special in terms of um, who's who's being given those in burial. But it is interesting the way that clearly um, the way in which people are dressed for burial clearly has quite sort of tight codes to it. Um, so um, it's very, very rare, for example, to find a skeletal male buried with these bead and brooch assemblages, even though the brooches themselves, the fundamental origin of them is Roman military. So, you know, the idea of the cruciform brooch, which a lot of these bow brooches are ultimately based on, that comes from late Roman military costume and is an idea that's taken and adapted. And then you suddenly have, have sort of two brooches rather than just one cloak brooch and that sort of thing. So, the sort of inspiration for the for the material is is one area of interest, but the, but they clearly are quite codified. So, um, if a, a a male is buried with additional items, often those are items of of weaponry. So most commonly spears, sometimes shields, more rarely a sword. If women are buried, it tends to be the beads and the brooches, and then you get some other items where everybody gets them. So. Everybody can have a knife, for example. A knife isn't a gendered item of clothing, it's a tool. Uh, lots of people will get different sorts of pottery vessels or other sorts of vessels. Um, so the interesting thing, you know, one of the things I really enjoy about this kind of work is looking at all of the data and working out the associations. So rather than making assumptions that this is a female item, this is a male item, you take your osteological work and then you take all your material culture and you work out who actually gets what. And then what does that tell you about the significance of the material itself? Um, but I can't tell you why the furnishing kind of goes over a bit over the top in this period, because um, it, it, it clearly does. It's clearly important. There's clearly a lot of time and thought put into how you bury people because we then get these relatively systematic patterns. But I don't know why that is. Right. Right. Interesting. Um, now, I want to think for just a second about um, both about the, the sort of wider landscape of this side of the river and, and who's doing what in Cambridge in this period. But I also want to think about um, the end of Roman Cambridge. Um, so so while these people are living 
well, we don't know quite where they're living, do we? Maybe that they're living at the criminology site. What do you think about that? Um, criminology site isn't big enough for all of them. So the criminology site was a little excavation. I think we had one hall, hall type building, you know, one other sort of building. It was, it was a, a very limited site there. Um, and, and we call it the criminology site because it's under the current criminology building. It was the excavation that took place before that building um, went up. Should I just um, show that map really quickly? Yeah, if you can find it, then we can, we can sort of point that out a little bit. Let's see if I can get that. Well, uh, this one will help, right? Yes. Here's the criminology building. So here we are, here's the river. Mm -hmm. And here's King's Garden Hostel, where we have some other burials that you excavated. That's right. Every time King's puts up a new accommodation block, you find an Anglo-Saxon cemetery. Um, <laughs> you should probably just plan for that in future. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, so say chronology site was, was a, a, a limited site in itself and didn't have a huge amount of settlement evidence, you know, one or two buildings, but, but not much more than that. Um, so there will be other settlements around, but because these settlements, um, the buildings in them are wooden and um, the main building type is a, is a post hole type building. So unless you do large open area excavations in the area where they exist, they're actually very hard to pick up archeologically. So it's not something that tends to be you know, found in antiquarian excavations, for example, they spot the burials, but they don't tend to spot the settlement sites. Um, so there will be settlements around, undoubtedly, um, but it's the cemeteries that tend to come to archaeological attention, particularly in, in sort of previous centuries. Um, and as you can see here, we're in a river valley. So this is sort of relatively fertile land, and it's um, a, a sort of a sprinkling of sites that go up this river valley. And that's true of Trumpington as well. That's sort of slightly further down. Um, yeah. so, so it's a very clear geographical pattern in terms of where these sites crop up. Um, and so because the cemeteries are generally along the rivers, we would assume that the settlements are in a similar zone. But it is true in this period that you don't tend to live where you bury people. There does tend to be a physical separation between your cemetery sites and your settlement sites. Um, but we've got no sense that people are living in Cambridge. Um, if I go back here, so this is late Roman Cambridge, right? It's on yes. the site of where the castle is now. Yes. This is the, the walled town of fourth century Cambridge. There's a suburb going on here. There are other um, burials that have been excavated here, um, Jesus Lane, etc. Mm -hmm. But this, nobody's living here in the sixth century, are they? Um, there are a few sort of um, bits and pieces of evidence, but because actually this is a relatively built up area anyway, again, you don't get the kind of the big expanse of excavation area where you can start to piece together a coherent picture. So it's um, partly it's that people may well not have been living in those areas. It's, it's a bit sort of up the hill and um, they do tend to seem to like the river valleys in, in this period. But also perhaps, you know, you've got a lot of Victorian buildings here. Victorian buildings are notorious because of, um, you know, cellars and deep foundations and, and you tend to just destroy anything where you've got large Victorian extensive terraces and that sort of thing. So it might be there, but we're not in a position to be able to say whether it was or wasn't, I think is the thing. Um, but it is true in this general period that where there are built remains, like the walls and stone structures, that there will often be an, an avoidance of that or a reservation of that area for some other purpose. So um, Roman York, for example, seems to become an ecclesiastical centre. And there are um, examples of that in other, in other former Roman towns as well. So it might be that they were reserved for more elite space um, rather than just normal settlement. That's, that's not a sort of an overlap that you tend to get. London would be the other sort of prime example of that, isn't it? That yeah. Roman London is basically uh, desolate and abandoned for centuries, whereas the, and the early medieval initial settlements are much, much further uh, away along the river. But along the river, yeah. yeah. Right. So, so we've got we don't know exactly where these people are living. They're probably not living in what was what was Roman Cambridge. Do we have to? Should we ask ourselves the question about what Bede says about Cambridge? <laughs> 
<laughs> we could, yeah. So that's a um, good example of why we, I think, we should throw away bead in some sense, isn't it? So the the story from bead is that um, that the monks of Ely are sent to go find uh, stones for a coffin, and they go on a boat. Um, and they come to a small deserted fortress not far away, which is called Grantochester, or depending on what the manuscript says, there are a couple of sort of slight changes to, to the way that that place name is given, which is called Grantochester in English, near the walls of a fortress. And they find a coffin beautifully made of white marble with a close fitting lid of the same stone. Now, people have historically taken that to be the ruins of Cambridge and that there's that in, in beads, day, or at least based on the information that Bede is using here, that nobody's living here. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, it, it could be entirely possible. Um, so the sort of, um, you know, the sarcophagus, you know, there, there are examples of, of that kind of coffin in later Roman cemetery. So, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a possible story. And of course, it's much closer in time to when he was writing. And the closer you get in time, possibly the more accurate it's going to be. Um, but of course, that's the end of the seventh century. So that's, you know, 100, 150 years later than probably the bulk of the, the, the burials that we've got at, at the Barton Road site. Um, so even throughout this period, even though we talk about it as a single period, actually, you've got several cemetery, several centuries of possible change within that anyway. And my sense about Bede is that he's got a radar that hits a certain kind of people and that there's a lot of people that he just doesn't acknowledge. So deserted for him might mean, might mean well, there's no ecclesiastical settlement there and there's no political structure in, in the area. And whatever is happening there is something that he's not particularly interested in. Um, so he, yes, he, he might be accurate in this case, but in a sense, if we structure all of our understanding about, uh, about Roman Cambridge from Bede, we'd be missing out on quite a lot of complexity and really genuinely interesting uh, mm. aspects, I think. Now, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the other cemeteries and how we know about them in the area? If I sort of go yes. back to that, uh, yeah. that image, yeah? Okay, so um, yes, we did um, sort of put together a little uh, snapshot of the different sites that we do know about and the, um, the kinds of records that we have for them. So um, if we work that down from kind of north to south, uh, number nine there is Girton, and then we'll kind of work our way down Grange Road and then down to Trumpington, because that's a really, really interesting series of sites there. So I think, if, Caroline, if you just want to kind of go through the slides. So this is a plan of the Girton Cemetery. Um, so you can see here the, the wings of the college and um, the antiquarian excavations that took place there. And both Girton and St John's were excavated um, by the same um, two, well, excavated by them, directed by the same two people. They were, they were using workmen, so, you know, untrained, essentially, um, diggers for these. Um, but the two people doing that were um, Von Hugel, who, as we saw, lived at Croft Cottage and probably found some of the, the Croft Garden material, um, and also um, uh, Jenkinson, who was the university librarian. So you've got the kind of the museum curator and the university librarian in their spare time digging up these major cemeteries. And it has to be said, not publishing them. Um, so if we go through Caroline, you'll see the sort of, um, so this is the, this is the published plan of the Girton site. And um, it's uh, not uh, to modern standards, shall we say. I do like the little stick figures and their yeah. interesting kind of um, depictions, but you know, this is, this is not how we, we would do it now. So Girton, as you can see, there are clearly cremation burials there. There are inhumation burials, and there are also some Roman burials. So there are documented um, Roman burials at this site. Um, and the next slide shows you um, uh, one of the cremations, the Roman cremations there in that lovely um, glass um, vessel. So, um, and I think the next one shows you some of the cremations. Yeah, here's some of the cremations from Girton as well. So um, that's a, a sort of a mixed rite cemetery, um, relatively extensive. Um, it was published um, by, I think a couple of um, people who were originally undergraduates so they kind of took the records um, but the the records themselves you can see an example of on the right hand side there so this is handwritten 
sort of verbatim notes of, of what was being excavated at the time. Um, and that's the, the records that um, Hollingworth and O'Reilly took to then try and write up the site. Um, so it's it sort of, you know, you're working with relatively patchy data there. Um, the next slide shows um, Saxe Medum, which um, is a, a house that was built, I think, in about 1912, and some um, burials were, were found during the construction of that. And it's um, over the road from the St John's cricket pitch site, um, which is the sort of marked on the, as the big cross on this um, OS map here. So it was when they were constructing one of the pavilions, again in the later 19th century, that the St John's excavations um, were found. Um, and uh, this is even shoddier actually in terms of documentation. So the St John's site has never been published. Um, there have been a few um, sort of uh, records of it in, in the various antiquarian um, publications, um, but as a, as a cemetery, it has never been published. So we've got um, the construction of the Rackets Courts is, is where it seems to have been, and it seems to have been quite an extensive cemetery. Um, the finds are in the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, and, and they're a bit kind of haphazardly organised into some grave groups, but, but it's, it's a really kind of complex and complicated site but again there it does appear to be some late roman material there and some and some relatively early um artifacts as well so potentially fifth century artifacts that we've got there um so you can see just about make out the anglo-saxon burial ground site of um on one of the <laughs> other um uh, os maps there um and again the records um are these handwritten slightly patchy day by day um, that's a kind of a good example I think the next one is um, a postcard from I can't remember whether it's from von Hugel to Jenkinson or the other way around one of them went away for for a period of time and the other was sending him postcards with descriptions and sketches and that's the extent of the documentation for that site um, so it's a um, as I say it's a slightly complex record um, and obviously this is a landscape where an awful lot is going on. So because of all the development work that's been happening both at West Cambridge and now at North West Cambridge, obviously there's been archaeological excavations under that area. And um, there's a whole sequence there of particularly Roman settlement. So we now have really quite a good handle on Roman settlement. North West Cambridge includes a, a Roman villa, for example. We know there's another Roman villa at Arbury, um, but relatively little in the way of early medieval kind of Anglo-Saxon. We've got the site at Girton, um, but it's because a lot of this excavation is on slightly higher ground clay kind of subsoil. And that does appear to be something that um, many early medieval communities avoid. So it seems to be gravel terrace, riverine terrace that they prefer to settle farm. And it's probably to do with farming technology, actually, lack of heavy plows and that sort of thing. Um, so it's a, there is a sort of a geographical distribution there. Um, so this is Fox's map of the um, cemeteries around the, the Roman towns. Um, and then as we kind of come back down, so, so um, this, um, uh, that's the criminology site. Yeah. So here's our hall type right. building, pretty much. And, and there's a couple of few other kind of pits and that sort of thing. And this is the garden hostel site. So this was a seventh century cemetery um, uh, just under the garden hostel there. Um, and coming back down, so here's our Croft Lodge um, finds. Um, and when we go on to the next slide, you can see that these are the sort of indications of earlier um, finds around that Croft Lodge site. So we did always strongly suspect that there was something there, um, but it was just a surprise that it survived under the buildings. Um, and so the final one we come to as we're kind of moving south down that river terrace is uh, the Trumpington excavations. And um, this was a, a small settlement site, probably just caught the southern edge of it, with four graves. And um, one of the graves was a, a, a bed burial with a, a female skeleton, probably 14 to 16 years old and um, the just beautiful cross and uh, golden garnet um, uh, pins that we've got here. So this is a really unusual um, burial type. Not many people get buried with beds or with these golden garnet crosses. This does appear to be really high status and possibly ecclesiastical in 
focus. So there do appear to be quite strong associations with um, Christianity and Christian burial. Um, and the interesting thing about this particular style of burial is that it's very strongly associated with women. So these very high status gold and garnet cross type um, artifacts um, are all found with women until they're found with St Cuthbert. Um, and that's the unusual one. So the fact that he is buried with a golden garnet cross is the unusual bit rather than the previous female burials associated with this. So but part of that whole new world that emerges much later on. Yeah. 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 So this is the point where you are getting probably increased social stratification and really kind of investment in these these types of, of burials. Thank you so much for this, Sam. I'm going to, uh, I think we should end there just so we have the chance to, to take some questions. And I think the Provost is going to take the questions for us. But let me just say thanks very much, Sam. I, I learned an awful lot. That was really lovely to hear you talk about. Uh, Mike, would you like to field the questions? Uh, or not. <laughs> Shall I field some of the questions? There are quite a few that are building up in the Q&A um, and I can start. Well, so there's a question here about what happened to children. Um, mm. Are there any child graves found on our site or in, in general? Um, and I think the answer to that is that there's relatively few children found on the site. Uh, I don't remember offhand the, the yeah. exact number, yeah. um, but and, and we do have Anglo-Saxon um, burials of children, don't we? We do, um, but not enough. And it's always been one of the really intriguing aspects of this period of burial is that there are never enough infants and children compared to what you do know about typical death rates in, the, in this period. So in this sort of period, you would typically expect really quite high levels of infant and child mortality. Um, and uh, we don't get nearly enough child and infant burials. So there are lots of interesting questions about why not? Um, are they dealt with in other ways? Um, uh, you know, what has actually happened to those burials? So the ones we do find are quite often furnished in a often a slightly more limited way, sometimes with particular items of, of material culture. Um, uh, and we can do a certain amount with that. But yeah, um, not, not nearly enough actual graves of them right. compared to what you would expect there to be. Um, I've got another question from a completely different angle here, mm -hmm. which is what, what language did these people speak? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we're not even entirely sure what languages people were speaking in in the fourth century. So, um, yeah, that's a, there's a, there's again some really interesting kind of work being done by um, sort of linguistic historians thinking about language change and the motivations and the reasons and the scale of it. Um, but in a time where certainly fifth and sixth centuries there are no written sources, so the most you've got to go on is you know some some scrappy bits of writing inscriptions on on material culture but that's very very rare um so yeah there's 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 quite a lot of you know interesting research that can still be done there sure sure and of course there's very different registers right there's the language that you speak to your children or when you're um getting raising the chickens but there's also the language that you that that the churchmen speak to each other and that's of course latin isn't it well or fundamentally latin there's a certain amount of old english happening but not at this pace at this point yeah um um, we've got um, other questions about uh, the location of the cemetery at Croft Gardens. Um, is, it, is it close to an ecclesiastical institution? What does that work? How does that work? And I should say, we never haven't actually specified here, um, and I think because you and I both know, but we never really clarified, this is, these are not Christian burials. These are, these are definitely not Christian burials. Um, there is a, um, there's a, a date that Bede gives us about the, the Christianization uh, of, of Britain, and that happens with Augustine's mission to Canterbury, so from Rome at the very end of the sixth century, but um, the and evidence would suggest that there's certainly interest in Christianity happening even before that um, that we can see from the material culture. But these people are not Christian uh, at all. Yeah. Um, so and, some of the seventh century burials might be. So Trumpington, I think, probably is. Um, but this period, fifth and sixth century, we think not. Yeah. 
And and so, but that does leave open a very interesting question about the, the location of the cemetery. And is it attached to any kind of wider mythological, uh, cosmographic, mm -hmm. cosmological sense? What do you think yeah. they believed in so, terms of the afterlife? I mean, that's that's an interesting question. I mean, they are being buried um, dressed. So there may well be a sense that you're sending them off somewhere else. Um, it's not uncommon to have um, uh, food deposits and other sorts of deposits. And, and because, you know, males were often buried with elements of weaponry. So to me, there is a sense that they are being sent off to do something else. Um, uh, but you can't say that for certain, of course. No, no, that's right. Um, there's another question about the orientation of the graves and mm. whether there's any significance to that. Um, um, it's certainly one of the things that you correlate. So you always look at orientation to see if there's any patterning in it. But actually, there's no automatic correlation between a West East oriented burial and Christianity. We have some clearly non-Christian 5th and 6th century burials that are West East and others that are all over the place. This is one of the more all over the place ones, I think. Um, uh, but it'll be interesting to see whether that variability corresponds to particular identities of the people in the graves or particular clusterings. Um, so they do look like most of them were marked because of there's there's a relative lack of intercutting of them. So so you know th there does seem to be a sense that you know where people are buried, and, and you know your reinsertion of a burial into another that's a clear sense of memory of this grave exists. We're going to add to it. Yeah, and it's probably worth saying that that's, um, that is quite interesting. I mean, if, if I've understood correctly, this is something that's that's relatively typical of early medieval graves in, 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 in Britain, that there's a, a kind of horizontal mm -hmm. sort of way that people, people sort of build outward from a core area mm -hmm. of burial. And certainly in the work that I've done in slightly later um, medieval Italy, uh, people, there, there's very little evidence that people, well, that's not true, that, pe that, that people knew that burials were along a certain path, but there's quite little concern for disturbing burials mm. and inserting another person um, into the same area. So that this does seem to be a particular feature of these societies. Um, yeah. Yes, the, the burial grounds tend to be quite extensive rather than constrained. So, so what, what you don't see is any sense of consecrated ground. So there isn't a kind of a, a boundary to most of these. They tend to spread outwards rather than anything else. Right. Right, interesting. Yeah, so there's a question that, uh, from someone who's asking um, how, how far this cemetery could have gone. And I think the short answer is we, we really don't know. It could have gone quite far and it, it in mm -hmm. some way they could be very much related to the things that are um, that are at Garden Hostel or beyond. Yeah, it's probably not that big because that would be absolutely enormous. Um, I think it, it definitely goes over the, the other side of Barton Road. It possibly goes up to the corner of Grange Road. Um, because there were some, fa fun some finds in that area as well. Um, but it probably doesn't go huge amounts further than that. So, I mean, a typical size for this period would be in the, you know, the 100 to 200, probably. Um, so we've got a good chunk of it, but, but there will be more of it. Um, there's, there's probably quite a lot of it either still under Barton Road or disturbed when Barton Road was, was built. So. Right. I've had somebody email me that says that um, that he remembers stories being told of a house on the opposite side of Barton Road and some and skeletons coming up in the back garden. Yeah, yeah that's um, documented. Actually, we do know about that one. Um, yeah. Um, I know I've got time for a, what, one or two more questions, let's say. Um, so one comes from Katie Campbell, who is a, 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 a medieval archaeologist in her own right, but who works in Central Asia. And she's very interested in the uh, example that you gave of the four women buried in Yorkshire that were differentiated in death, even though they may have been living in a community for some time, um, suggesting that the location of birth might be more important than the community one is living in later on. And is that something that's that sort of... Yeah. Um, found elsewhere and is it found with men as well? So it, it's not a systematic pattern. I mean, the, the honest answer is that that um, we haven't done huge amounts of the known sites in terms of isotopic studies. So the sites that have been done have really been done as kind of trials of the method uh, with some um, sort of you know initial results. But you probably need to do that at scale to then pull out more of these these questions. So, I mean, the interesting thing, every time we do an isotopic study of a cemetery, it comes up with a different sort of pattern. So, you know, we've got some where you've clearly got male outsiders coming in. We've got others where it's, you know, a handful of women that come in and they're not furnished in a typical way. And we've got others where almost everybody looks absolutely local. So 
there doesn't appear to be any kind of systematic pattern to it for the few that we've done so far. But, you know, there are over a thousand Anglo-Saxon cemeteries and we've probably done 10, so. Right, right. And, and, and we're going to do this one, aren't we? That one of the questions that we, we really do want to explore yeah. is what the isotopes tell us about migration and movement, as well as potentially DNA. Now, there's a final question which addresses an issue that, um, that well, there are many more questions that I'm afraid we're not going to be able to get to. But there's a, a final question that I'd like to get to, which addresses an issue that I'm extremely interested in about this, which is sixth century plague. Mm. And the, the question is, do we have any evidence of sixth century plague in these skeletons? Uh, and the, the, the short answer to this is, is not yet. Um, mm. that, that has to be, that, that, that can only be found with really uh, very, very high resolution and specific kinds of, um, of, of, of ADNA work. And it requires a certain degree and a certain kind of, of preservation of the remains. But it's very high on our um, list of things that we want to explore about this site because um, one of the sites that was on Sam's map, um, the Barrington Edicts Hill, has produced really quite significant um, evidence of Yersinia pestis, uh, which is the um, the, the, the bacterium that causes the bubonic plague, which we know from historical sources uh, was uh, rampant in the Mediterranean in the, in, in, the, in the sixth century. We call it the Justinianic plague because it was during the reign of Justinian, so in the 540s. Um, and, and it certainly was here. And not only was it here, but a very early, um, uh, uh, because we can trace genetic mutations of the disease, we know that a very early form of, uh, of the disease was here uh, in Barrington. So this is something that is incredibly interesting to explore uh, and we will absolutely be looking for. And so what, how, does, how do we fit this new piece of information about Justinianic plague into our wider understanding of the sixth century? Yeah, so I mean, there's other really interesting things going on in the sixth, sixth century, like the uh, late, anti late antique little ice age. So um, our continental colleagues have been talking for some time about the impacts that they are seeing from this climatic downturn in the middle of the, fifth, in, in the, middle of the sixth century that's now being increasingly well documented. So that's another of the questions, you know, what, what impact is climate having, you know, that, that sort of period of climate change having on these settlements. Um, so it is possible that actually one of the things that we're seeing in this grave good expression is societal uncertainty. And you know, you're, it might be that you've got a period where suddenly everything starts to go wrong and the impact that you then see on that in, in the, the cemetery evidence is gonna be one of the really interesting things to look at. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for that, Sam. Um, I'm going to hand back then to the provost who is returning after computer difficulties. <laughs> He'll be able to, 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 to finish us off then. <laughs> Yes, yes, thank you very much. It's nice to be back after a minor meltdown in my in my study. I'm very sorry. Anyway, I heard almost all that and some of the questions. And thank you very much, uh, Caroline and Sam. Absolutely fascinating, really interesting. And um, I hope that the very large audience enjoyed that. Thank you very much, audience, for joining in and listening. Um, I see there, was, there were 300 uh, participants registered just a moment ago. Fantastic. There is a recording, the recording still going on, and it will be available for those who want to listen later. Um, I know I can speak for Newnham College as well as King's College. We just want to see people back in Cambridge and their respective colleges just as soon as we can. So let us hope that the recent small improvements uh, that we're seeing will be able to continue uh, at, until, um, until the summer. So we keep our fingers crossed. Anyway, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to our principal speakers and hope to see you all for another event uh, at this website quite soon. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>